to us. We do ask the Lord then this afternoon as uh, he finishes up that he will bless this time, Lord. Bless waiting. Bless us, oh Lord, after uh, a full uh, meal. Lord, help us to stay awake and pay attention. But Lord, we also pray that, that you would uh, fill our hearts, Lord, with the joy of the gospel, the joy of the Christ's work and what he has done for us and bring us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And so, Lord, do bless us time now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I almost want to say in the year that King Uzziah died, but that we've already we've we've already we've already done that. Um, now, the, the, here's here's what I'm wanting you to see. This is a salvation now, redemption being typified. It's promised in Genesis three as an ascent up the mountain. It is now typified, and the work of Christ is pre-enacted. Now, let me put it this way as a guide for you, just so this is clear. Jesus' work is not patterned after Moses. Moses' work is patterned after Jesus. And so that primal gospel promise in Genesis 3 tells you that one will come from the seed of the woman, crush the serpent's head, pour his life out in death, clothe his people with garments and endow them with his image, pass under the flaming sword, ascend the mountain of the Lord, eat from the tree of life, and bring a people to see the glory of God in worship. That is the work of Christ that is being promised, and Moses is typifying that work. And so when we say Moses is a priest of the order of Melchizedek, he is conforming to the work of the Messiah, not the Messiah conforming to the work of Moses. And so this is a pre-enactment of the work of Christ as a Melchizedekian high priest. And just for the sake of clarity, it occurs in two fundamental stages. First, Moses seeks to prepare himself and offer himself as a um, vicarious sacrifice, one given on behalf of his people, and it is as such that he is going to ascend into the presence of the Lord and call and plead for the presence and rest of God to be with his people. And so the question remains here, where is the typology of the Messiah given even clearer expression. Well, look in verse 11. In 33, sorry, in Exodus 33, 11, we see the point about the heightening or the unique typology associated with Moses in the tent of meeting. Un and this is key. Unlike Aaron or anyone else in Israel, Moses is face to face with God in the tent of meeting and friend to friend. 
Now this is the heart of the covenant relation. Adam is created to see God's face as friend in heaven. And Moses, as he enters into the tent of meeting in Exodus 33, 11, is face to face. He is friend to friend with God. At the heart of the covenant relation is not a mere legal relation to God, but a relationship where life flows into life. Face-to-face, friend-to-friend communion with God is what lies at the heart of Moses' mediation. And in this instance, Meredith Klein, in Images of the Spirit on page 65, says that when Moses alone is face-to-face and friend-to-friend with God in the tent of meeting, he calls that a prophetic token of what awaits the saints at the resurrection. I want to put it this way. Beginning in verse 3311, and then when Moses ascends on the top of the mountain to have fellowship with God, this is, as far as Old Testament revelation is concerned, the high point of such revelation. This is one man being brought into the personal presence of God where friend beholds friend in a person-to-person communion bond that consists in worship. Focused a bit more on Christ, what Moses had on Mount Sinai is a prophetic token of what will transpire in Christ first when he is raised bodily from the dead and 40 days later ascends into heaven to see the glory of the Father in the power of the Spirit. In his ascension, remember, Christ rises to sit at the right hand of God and is filled with joy at being at his right hand. And it is an anticipation of that person-to-person, face-to-face, friend-to-friend fellowship that Moses has in the tent of meeting. And so if you ask the question, what is the blessing for the pure of heart? They shall see God. Moses sees the glory of God in this typical structure of the tent of meeting. Second, there is the heart of covenant relation that begins in verses 12 through 14 of chapter 33. This is Moses' intercession, properly speaking. Let us read. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me, yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight and consider too that this nation is your people. Now stop there. What is Moses saying? Moses is entering into the presence of God, known by God and possessing the favor of God. And how does he address God in relation to the people? It's basically this. If I have found favor in your sight, through me and in light of me, show favor to your people. Let the bond a friend-to-friend, face-to-face fellowship that I have with you flow over and extend to the people that are your very own. And so in verses 12 through 14, Moses makes this request. And what does God say? God says in verse 14, My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Now right there, as Moses is, is uh, from the tent of meeting to enter into the glory presence of God, what is awaiting Moses? The presence of God and the rest 
of God atop a holy mountain. The very thing that Adam lost, which was the presence of God and the promised rest of God, what is Moses receiving? That very thing. It is a redemptive reversal of Adam's fall and banishment from the mountain as a mediator figure offering himself on behalf of his people to make atonement and secure presence and rest. It is presence and rest that the Lord gives to Moses. And then in verse 16 and 15, he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight? I and your people. Do you hear that? Moses and the favor that Moses secures is not simply for Moses, but for the people represented by Moses in the presence of God. It's a representative, mediatorial approach to God whereby through Moses, the rest and presence of God is extended to the church. You could think of it this way, it's almost as though Moses is receiving the first fruits of God's presence and rest, and in him, the church, this wilderness community, will receive the same. And in 15 through 17, God promises Israel presence, and because God knows Moses' name, that presence will continue to the people. And so what's happening? Think of it this way. As Moses ascends into the presence and rest of God, Israel is representatively included in him. The ascent up the mountain to know the glory and presence and rest of God is first for Moses and then for those who are in Moses. Paul anticipates this idea and brings it out in a slightly different context when he says that Israel was baptized into Moses. 1 Corinthians 10, 4 and following. Here, Israel is represented by and is ascending into the presence of God with Moses. Then in 18 through 23, Moses asks that God show him his glory. It is as though as Moses is in the presence of God, he says, show me the fullness of your glory. Satisfy my heart with the glory of your presence. And so while Moses will not enter the land, what does God do? God tells him, you cannot see my face and live, but behold, there is a place by me where you will stand on a rock. Verse 21. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of it. I will cover you with my hand until I've passed by. And then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So while Moses does not enter the land, Moses gets what lies at the heart of the land's religious significance, friend to friend fellowship with God by which he beholds his glory in an unprecedented way. And it's in this context that Moses, in Exodus 34, receives the replacement tablets of the covenant that God made with Israel coming out of Egypt. Look at verse 34. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words which are on the first tablets which you broke, Be ready by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself to me on top of the mountain. So in Exodus 34, beginning in verse 3, Moses is to do what? He is to now ascend from the tent of meeting onto the mountain where he will receive from God the tablets of the covenant. And no one, verse 3, shall come up with you lest... No one be seen throughout all the mountain. No flocks or herds can graze. So Moses did what? He cut the two tablets of the stone like the first, rose early in the morning, and in verse 4, went up on Mount 
Sinai. It is there that now you have Moses ascending the mountain of the Lord and the covenant that was made with Israel coming out of Egypt is now renewed as Moses ascends. And as the Lord commanded him, he took the two tablets of stone and it's there that the Lord, verse 5, the Lord descended in what we could call a glory cloud. Verse 5. Descended from where? Descended out of the highest heaven. The Lord, in his glory, descended from the heavenly temple and lit Mount Sinai ablaze with the glory of his presence in the form of a cloud. Moses, lifted up, ascends to the top of that mountain, and the glory of the Lord descends from the heavenly tabernacle, the heavenly temple, and fills that mountain with the glory of the Lord reflected and shadowed down out of heaven. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed his name. And the name of God is a revelation of the personal presence of God, a revelation of his glory and power. And what, what do you have here? It seems so clear, does it not? You have a top Mount Sinai in a glory cloud, the glory of heaven in a provisional, earthly, mountaintop form. And Moses stands in that presence as the one who has been given what? The presence and rest of God and the personal dwelling of God's glory atop that mountain surrounds and envelops Moses as he hears the word of the Lord and receives these new commandments. This restatement of the substance of the covenant. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And listen, here's the heart of the covenant. And Moses quickly bowed down his head toward earth and worshiped. Verse 8. The essence of the covenant relation is worship. The worship that we saw in the heavenly temple of the seraphim surrounding God and calling out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Moses now enters into a proleptic, anticipatory worship filled with the same glory that fills the highest heavens. The glory of heaven, the glory of the Lord in heaven has condescended to the top of this mountain in the form of a cloud where friend beholds friend in worship and adoration. Listen, it's not the end of the world, but it's the way the world ends the Lord descending and showing his glory to his church and his church expressing worship in the presence of that glory. And Moses says, as he worships, the worshiping mountain ascending mediator says, if now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, Please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for this is a stiff-necked people. Pardon our iniquity and sin, and take us for your inheritance. The heart of this covenant is that God is the inheritance of his people. It's not a land. It's not a set of things. It's not an earthly plot. It is that God himself is the inheritance of his people, even as his people is his inheritance. 
And he said to Moses, Behold, I am making a covenant. Before all your people I will do marvels such as not been created in all the earth or in any nation, and all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it is an awesome thing that I will do with you. God reveals his glory, his presence, his rest to Moses, and this is the substance of the covenant. So from the divine side, what is it? It is a manifesting of the glory of God that fills the heavenly temple atop earthly Mount Sinai. What is the covenant from the human side of response? Whole-souled worship and adoration of that glory, first in the mediator, and then in him the people are included. And so this is the core of this covenant. Moses, unlike Adam, is not banished from the glory presence, but Moses ascends into the presence of God that is now reflecting that glory of heaven in a temporary earthly form. This is beyond what Adam knew. God is now showing forth his glory on a mountain, to a mediator who is presented as a pre-enactment of Christ himself. This is a sign, a symbol of a glory that is not losable. A glory that is coming in the one who will crush the serpent's head, clothe his people, raise the church heavenward to the mountain presence of God. Now, A critical note here, as I move a little faster than we might want, but a critical note here is uh, found in Exodus 34, 28. This is where the typology of Christ, where Moses is conforming to the likeness of Christ, comes so clear. In Exodus 34, 28, Moses was with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain, surrounded by his glory. He neither ate bread nor drank water, and he wrote on the tablets of the covenant the Ten Commandments. Now what does that tell you? Moses did not eat bread or drink water for 40 days and 40 nights, yet he lived in the presence of of God. Jesus would say, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And it is in Exodus 34, 28 that you see so clearly that Moses is living in a way that anticipates the very resurrection life of Christ that he typifies. He lives and flourishes without eating or drinking a thing for 40 days and 40 nights. And it has to be then, there, that you begin to see the one who bears the glory of an indestructible life. Jesus, when he rises from the dead, according to Hebrews 7.16, rises in the power of an indestructible life Moses, for 40 days and 40 nights on Sinai, lives in the presence of God and does not die. In fact, in verse 29, it is from that glory, it is from this glory of the Lord, in verse 29, 34, 29, that Moses descends... And as he descends, he brings with him the glory of God's presence and rest and the substance of this covenant. Look, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone 
because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Just as Adam and Eve saw God coming in the judgment and cool or spirit of the day in Genesis 3.8 and ran and tried to hide, so Aaron and Israel see Moses coming with his glory, the glory that he bears in his person, having talked to God, and they seek to run. But Moses, like God in Genesis 3, Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked to them. And all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face was shining. In his descent to Israel, he brings with himself the glory of of the fellowship bond that he had with the Lord on the mountain. He is resplendent and radiant with life that does not perish. He bears within himself the presence and rest of God that transfigures and transforms. You could think of Moses in this instance as the first fruits of life that knows no end. You can think of Moses as a forerunner of the life that exists in the presence of God atop a holy mountain as that life does not end. Forty days and forty nights is a typical expression of eternal resurrection life. And as Moses descends to the people, He brings this as a great forerunner of that which is to come in the promised Messiah. And so two key points need to stand out here. First, the Ten Commandments that accompany Moses underscore the fact that these commandments are given in a covenant of grace. Deliverance from Egypt by blood, 19 and 20, coupled with Moses' intercession to secure forgiveness and the ongoing presence of God, that is the context of the giving of this Decalogue. And Moses, then, gives the Ten Commandments as the terms of the redemptive communion bond that God enters into with his people. What is given to Moses is given through Moses. Presence, rest, and glory. Second, the glory on Moses' face is a prophetic token of the coming glory of Christ. Why? Moses is not a high priest according to the order of the Levitical system. He is a high priest according to a Melchizedekian order. Not an order where he offers animal sacrifice through prescribed ritual, but where he himself enters into the presence of God, offering himself for the people, so that through his mediation, there might be the presence and rest of God that goes with his people. But he bears it in such a way as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, that the glory begins to fade. Moses is not the Messiah. He is merely a type. And that is true because he puts a veil over his face and hides the fact that the glory that he had on the mountain begins to fade as he descends from the mountain. The veil on his face is a 
visible reminder of the transient and typical character of the provision he secured. Moses is a symbol of God's redemptive presence with his people, but as Voss reminds us, he is only a symbol. The reality that he typifies is yet future. Now what do you start to see here? What you start to see is that Exodus 32 through Exodus 34 is a typological reenactment of what was promised in Genesis 3. Do you see it? One from the seed of the woman represents that people. He enters into the presence of God, ascends a mountain, secures presence and rest, And through Him, presence, rest, and glory are given to the people He represents. You have a creational mountain in Eden. You have a typical mountain on Sinai. And what Moses anticipates on that typical mountain, what Moses pre-enacts on that typical mountain, is what will be climactically fulfilled as Jesus Christ, as a high priest, does what? As he returns to God in a sacrifice, and having returned to God in a sacrifice on behalf of his people, 40 days after his resurrection, will ascend into the most holy places in heaven, where he makes intercession for his people until such time that he brings them where he is. And so this presentation here in Exodus 32 through 34, the salvation typified and pre-enacted by Moses the mediator, where he ascends into the presence of God as a representative and mediator on behalf of the people to bring to them the rest and the presence and the glory that God has given to him is precisely the background for understanding the book of Hebrews. And so what we're going to do in the last hour and maybe 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a quick break here, is refocus now on how these themes that we've seen from Genesis, Ezekiel 28, and now Exodus 32 through 34, explains why the author of Hebrews presents Jesus Christ in his death and in his ascension as, listen, as opening the way into heaven, understood as a tabernacle dwelling and understood as a mountain dwelling where Christ lives to intercede for his church. And we'll look at that after about a seven to ten minute break. Questions? Yes, sir. Is there something covenantally second trip up and down the mountain and, and does that if it exists does that difference account for the difference in the commandments that are enumerated in chapter 34 from the commandments as they're enumerated in chapter 20 let me put it this way in terms of the question there's no difference in substance between the ascent on the mountains um, But what you have in Exodus 20, um, moving into Exodus 32 through 34, is you have a fundamental breaching of the covenant with which God entered into his people. Because Exodus 19.4, God brought his people out of Egypt to himself through blood and through Moses. They were baptized into Moses in the waters of the Red Sea. But by the time you get to Exodus 32, there is an escalation of apostasy and idolatry within Israel such that Israel winds up, in essence, reenacting the sin and fall of Adam by overtly worshiping creatures 
and idols made from their own earthly possessions and then attributing to those idols the power to save. Um, you had pointed out earlier this is very close to what you find as the unpardonable sin during the earthly ministry of Jesus because um, it's not identical, of course, but there was an ascription to Jesus that what he does, he does by Beelzebub, by Satan, and that is a fundamental and demonic misconstrual of his person and work. But what happens here is something um, almost the reverse. The work of God is ascribed to idols here. Behold your gods who brought you out. What, what this means is that the covenant relation in blood that God entered into with Israel when he brought them out of Egypt through the destroying angel through Passover, that covenant has been fundamentally rejected by the people of God. And what you have in Exodus 32 through 34 is a renewal of the substance of that covenant. And, and what, but what you get here, I think, in Exodus 32 through 34 is a heightening and enriching of the telos of that covenant through Moses as a mediator. And I don't know, uh, I'll just make you aware of this. I find this to be quite useful. Klein has, Meredith Klein has an, an essay that's very much worth looking at. He sees the book of Exodus as the Old Covenant or Old Testament foundation for the gospel genre. And in the gospel genre, what do you have? You have the story of the mediator and you have his, his birth, his life, his growth, his development, the way he inaugurates the covenant by the shedding of blood and the way he rises. And, um, and then if you think about Luke Acts, particularly you get a movement into ascension. Once he rises from the dead, he ascends and pours out the spirit. Um, what you have here, I think, in the book of Exodus, and especially now with Moses as mediator, is you get a really crisp Old Testament expression of the background of the synoptic gospel genre. Because you have a mediator who offers himself, and as he offers himself, ascends up into the glory presence of God, where he finds the presence and rest of God, and then having received that, brings the covenant that provides that presence to the people. So this is really, if I could put it this way, this is kind of an Old Testament anticipation of Pentecost, where the one who gives himself in self-sacrifice ascends the holy mountain receives the glory presence of God, his countenance is transformed, the presence and rest of God go with him and through him to the people, and he condescends or comes back down from the mountain with the substance of that covenant, bearing the presence of God as a mediator. And so here, I think, what, what's different from 19 and 20 is you have the, the presentation not merely of that Melchizedekian priesthood, but you get that, that synoptic gospel genre being presented really clearly because it is through the sacrifice and offering and giving of Moses himself as a priest in the order of Melchizedek that he ascends and then descends to bring the presence and rest of God to the people in a covenant. In a covenant that is not sealed in the blood of animals per se. That you do get through the Levitical order. But, um, but in terms of, of other details, I would want to say that it's a fundamental covenant renewal with this heightened typology within it that reminds you that what's happening here is a redemptive approach of God, not according to the order of the Levitical priesthood, but according to a different order. And so this is an intensification and redemptive pre-enactment of Pentecost almost, in a way that you don't see, I think, nearly as clearly in 19 and 20. Did you want to follow up on? Well, j just yeah. about the, the commandments themselves that, okay. th that are in 34. They, they seem different from the commandments in chapter 20. And then when it says he wrote these commandments, these 10 commandments, he seems to be referring to these 
commandments that start in verse 11. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if that, whether it's a change of emphasis or the change of, uh, or, or expansion of uh, uh, focus. I'll tell you, changes, yeah, changes one, thing that's, one thing that's focused and expanded here is in verse 11 especially, the two tablets of the testimony are the Decalogue. So that's the substance of what's renewed. But when that covenant is renewed and um, the marvels are spoken of, I think it's especially beginning in verse 11 that you begin to move toward the conquest that, that you're, you're going to see under Joshua in, in anticipatory form. Because I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, and take care lest you make a covenant with them in the land you go, lest it become a snare in your midst. And so it's kind of a forecasting and preparation for the entering into the land and the conquest that I think will be coming at a time future in the land. It's preparation for that. And what's grounding it and what is, is um, um, underwriting it is this making a covenant by which I, the Lord, will do awesome things, but those awesome things are going to be tethered now in a unique way to this renewed covenant that brings into view the presence of God and the rest and glory of God that comes uniquely through Moses. And then Moses is going to be the one who, when he dies, the covenant will be succeeded and the leadership will then pass to Joshua, who will be the one who actually enters into the land and the Lord drives the nations out in, a, in the form of conquest. I think that's partly what is happening. Um, and then I think as you move toward the end of the book, um, in Exodus 40 in particular, all of this is moving now and with the commandments and the laws toward a revelation of the glory of God in the tabernacle where the glory of God covers the tent of meeting, the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle, verse 34, and Moses is not able to stay in that tent. The glory is such a full expression that whereas Moses was able to stand for face-to-face -face and friend-to-friend -friend fellowship in the tent of meeting, on the far side of that glory coming, there is a form of glory that drives Moses out, that Moses cannot tolerate or bear, not even Moses. And insofar as it does that, I think that this episode here is anticipating not simply the conquest in the land, but the coming of a glory that vastly supersedes Moses and a glory that Moses himself could not bear to see. And what is that glory? It's the glory that Paul will argue in 2 Corinthians 3 is the glory that once it comes, 2 Corinthians 3.10, the glory that comes in the ascension of Christ makes what was once glorious under Moses of no glory because of the surpassing glory. So this, is, this, this episode here, especially as you view a, a coming of glory at the end of Exodus when it's like the tabernacle is complete after a, a sabbatical process. And now the Lord coming from his Sabbath rest in heaven descends to fill that tabernacle. That glory is so great that Moses cannot bear it. It is there that you see an intensification of the typology and a preparation for one whose glory will supersede the glory of Moses. And so I think this mountain theme serves that well. Yes, sir. Wait. I'll give it a shot.
maybe, and I don't know, if, Wayne, if this is going to get to your question, and you can tell me, um, but I, I think what we have to recognize is there's always a distinction between Moses and those for whom he mediates. Because back in Exodus 19 and 20, nothing can touch the mountain but Moses. Only Moses can ascend and descend. And that's repeated here. Only Moses can enter into the tent, and only Moses is told to go atop Mount Sinai to receive the law, see the glory of God, and the presence and rest will transfigure his countenance as he becomes a prophetic token of the very thing that he possesses as mediator. So I, I think that we could say something along these lines that Moses is himself redeemed just like Israel is redeemed. And yet, at the same time, Moses has a unique heightened function that distinguishes him in both episodes from Israel because he is the mediator who alone ascends into the presence of God, receives the covenant, and discloses it um, as the mediator of that old covenant order. And so you can say that in, from the standpoint of sonship, the nation as a whole is a son of God, Exodus 4.23. But even when the nation is referred to as a son in Exodus 4.23, what is the language God uses? Moses, you tell Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son. Let my son go that he may worship me. And who is the one through whom this son will be delivered? God acting through the mediator, Moses. And so I, I, would, I would just want to say that while Moses is himself um, a son in the house and not the son over the house, Hebrews 3.6, he nonetheless has a unique typical role in both instances that marks him out, I think, peculiarly as a type of Christ in a way that no one else is. And so he points us to Christ in, uh, in Voss's language in an intensive and heightened way that no one else does, neither Aaron nor the nation as a whole. And that's what I'm trying to pick up on. Did I even get close to your question? Am I digging in the right ballpark? Yeah, yeah, very, very good. Yes, sir. Well, let me tell you why, what I think you're after, um, and, and this might be useful. This is in part why Paul calls in, in 2 Corinthians 3, um, 7 through 10, the Apostle Paul comments on this episode, and he refers to the ministry of Moses in fascinating ways. He says that the ministry of death carved on letters of stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. Will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Here's the point about Moses' mediation. Moses mediates not for the entire church, but for a small cross-section. And God hears Moses, knows Moses, and extends his rest and presence 
through Moses to the people, but what is the outcome of that long term? It's over almost before it got going. Because the glory on Moses' face, the way it is fading, and the fact that that generation for whom Moses mediated and with whom God continued for a time was just that, for a time. And so, from one standpoint, what was Moses doing? Moses was making atonement. Moses was the friend of God, accepted by God, knew the presence and rest of God, and brought this covenant to the people of God, and they drew near and were not consumed by Moses' presence, but they received what? They received the covenant. But what happens to that generation? Their bodies fall in the wilderness for what reason? Because the author of Hebrews will tell us because of sustained, comprehensive, and chronic lack of faith and disobedience. And so what you get there is in its, in its essence, it is a redemptive mediation on behalf of Israel. God hears, God relents, God goes with the people, but the people themselves, their bodies fall in the wilderness, so much so that in, 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 its, in its fundamental outworking, it is a ministry of condemnation and death. Life and, and redemptive provision were given through Moses, but it is not the thing that delivers into the heavenly presence of God but is an impermanent, transient thing that could not bring the people into typical land rest. So the author of Hebrews is going to say, if that rest could not be secured either through Moses or in 4.8 through Joshua, how much more is it needed for one whose mediation can bring rest? So it, it's, it's a, it, we don't want to deny the redemptive character of all that was transacted with Moses, but we want to recognize the fact that as it was enacted, it brought only a temporary staying of divine judgment and did not bring the full orb deliverance into heavenly places, nor did it bring Israel up into the glory of the mountain where the Lord showed Moses his, his, uh, his hind parts. So um, it, it's not the redemption that you find in Christ, but it is a temporary, ad hoc redemption in Moses, but it does not have the efficacy to bring full deliverance to the people. The bodies fell in the wilderness due to what? Due to sustained unbelief. Do you want to follow up and push further? Very good, very good. Any others? It's been an hour with the q and I probably shouldn't have done that, but let's take about a, a five to ten minute break, and then we'll come back, and I'm going to see what I can do to, um, oh, try to, try to bring this to a conclusion as we look at some themes from the book of Hebrews.